Uh, hello. Um, I want to welcome you all to the University of Pittsburgh Law School. I'm Professor Jules Lobel. I teach constitutional law here, and we are very pleased to have this lecture here today. We, um, we always do, every year, a Lawyering for Social Justice uh, lecture at the law school. It's an annual event. And the law school feels a, a compelling mission to train lawyers, to train law students, to engage in the practice of social justice and the advocacy of social justice. And we have had a number of very prominent uh, activists, advocates, and scholars in the area of social justice give this annual lecture. Uh, two years ago, we had Brian Stevenson, oh. who's written a, <laughs> um, a best-selling book, Just Mercy, and is the executive director of the Equal Justice Initiative in Alabama. He gave this presentation. A number of years before that, we had Lonnie Guineer from Harvard Law School and Gerald Torres from Cornell Law School give this presentation. We've had Vince Warren, who's the executive director of the Center for Constitutional Rights. David Cole, who's the now, he's a professor at Georgetown, is now the legal director of the American Civil Liberties Union, give this presentation. So it is with great, um, a great honor to welcome another illustrious scholar and activist, Martha Shamalis, to the law school today. And Deb Brake will give, introduce the introduction for Martha. Right, thank you, my friend. Welcome, everyone, tonight. Thank you so much for coming out for this really exciting evening. It is truly my pleasure and my great, great honor to introduce tonight's distinguished speaker for our 2019 Lawyering for Social Justice lecture, Martha Shamalis. Martha Shamalis is the Robert J. Lynn Chair in Law at The Ohio State University, where she teaches torts, employment discrimination, feminist legal theory, and courses on gender and the law. She is a leading national scholar in employment discrimination, tort law, and indeed on many varied issues affecting women, feminism, gender, and justice. I could go on a very long time about her scholarly bona fides, but since that would just delay our getting to the reason we're all here, I'm only going to mention a few of them. She is the author with Jennifer Riggins of The Measure of Injury, Race, Gender, and Tort Law. She has a brand new hot off the presses treaties on employment discrimination law that I just got my hot hands on today with a signed copy. And she literally wrote the book on feminist legal theory, the book that is used in law school classrooms around the country and titled appropriately, Introduction to Feminist Legal Theory, or I wrote the book on feminist legal theory. <laughs> uh, she has published in the highest echelons of law journals, Michigan, Penn, Chicago, UCLA, I could go on. She's been a visiting professor at the Harvard Law School among many other distinguished institutions. Her work is broad and it is varied, but the common element is her use of critical feminist insights to disrupt established paradigms, press the boundaries of law, and draw feminism into conversation with allied social justice movements. Before joining the OSU faculty, Professor Shamala served on the faculty at Louisiana State University, the University of Iowa, where she also chaired the Women's Studies program, and right here at the University of Pittsburgh School of Law, where she was a member of our faculty from 1994 to 2002. I call those the Martha Shamalis years. <laughs> and uh, for those of us who had the privilege to serve on the Pitt Law faculty during the Martha Shamalis years, all of these accolades and distinctions do not begin to capture the essence of the real Martha Shamalis, whose insights, sense of humor, and nose for social justice remain unsurpassed. Several of us have had the good fortune to be mentored by Martha Shamalis. I'm looking at a couple of them in the front row here. Uh, Martha Shamalis is known far and wide for her wisdom and generosity in mentoring newer entrants into the legal academy. Many legal scholars are adept at deconstruction and critique, and Martha Shamalis can hold her own with the very best of those. 
But what truly stands out to me about Martha Shamalis is a much, much rarer quality, the ability to build up. Build up ideas, build up institutions, build up theory, and build up people. All with an eye toward realizing the feminist aspiration of a more just world. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Martha Shamalis. I'm overwhelmed. It is so wonderful to be back at Pitt. And I just felt like, yes, yes. And I felt like um, it had been quite a long time, actually 17 years, and that's a long time. The building has changed, the faculty has, has changed, and, but there's still that wonderful feeling of coming home, coming back. And, and I just have to say with Jules and Debbie and Lewin and Vivian and Tony and Bernie and so many others. Uh, it's Bob, it's, it is great to see colleagues. It is great to see the students here. I went to Jules' seminar, uh, was reminded of just how interesting Pitt students can be. And um, it's just very nice to be able to meet um, and give this lecture to everyone. So um, I'm going to be, I hope you can hear, I'm kind of mic'd up. Um, I'm going to be giving my lecture here. Uh, so maybe I can look at the slides if I want. But also because I just kind of look like a talking head <laughs> there. I said to Debbie, how much can you actually see? And she said, well, just here. And I thought maybe it would be a little bit more informal if I'm here. So I, ho I hope you can all hear. So um, my topic today is um, the Me Too movement. Um, and uh, it's quite interesting that it's been a little over a year since uh, actress uh, Alyssa Milano sent this tweet. There was more to the tweet. If you've ever been sexually harassed or assaulted, write Me Too to reply to this tweet. And so many celebrities and thousands of other women took to social media, media, as we know, to tell their stories of sexual assault, abuse, and harassment, that in a relatively short period of time, Me Too became a movement. Um, and it was sped up, of course, by the amplifying effects of Twitter, Twitter and all forms of uh, new communication. Think about how telescope this is, because by December 2017, uh, Time Magazine had declared that the silence breakers of the Me Too movement were the persons of the year, and they beat out Donald Trump for that particular recognition. I think that this past year and a half has showed that the Me Too movement has some staying power. We never know how long, but some staying power, uh, particularly given uh, th the competition for attention when each day seems to bring a new crisis or outrage or hardship that relates to social justice. Um, so Professor Cass Sunstein um, has written a little essay about the Me Too movement, and I'm, you know, he. He occasionally writes on issues of gender, but that's not his wheelhouse, so I thought, let's hear what Sunstein has to say. And um, he went so far as to call Me Too what he called a revolutionary cascade. And, and he analyzed, uh, he analogized it to the, uh, to the Arab Spring. And he said in its reverberating and potentially transformative effects, um, well, I'm not so sure I think it's quite that revolutionary, but the one thing that I think I know for sure is that Me Too has made victims see their experiences in a new light. It has that power for the people, the victims themselves. It has afforded victims a new measure of credibility, 
all this Believe Women part of the Me Too movement. And in many instances, it has uh, turned a sense of shame and embarrassment into a sense of dignity. Now, uh, most people know Me Too for its tangible consequences. And what has been described as a naming, shaming, and firing cycle, uh, for those social scientists, we know there's the naming, blaming, and claiming, but I sort of like this naming, shaming, and terminating cycle. Uh, many high-profile men have been terminated or forced to resign, and the list is very long. In the entertainment industry, there's Harvey Weinstein, politicians, Al Franken, celebrity <coughs> chefs, Mario Batali, judges, Alex Kaczynski, physicians, Larry Nasser, the uh, media executives, Les Moonves, to mention only a few. By the way, the New York Times in October of um, 2018 counted how many of these, and that was 2018, so we've come far. There were 201 terminations of prominent individuals. Um, about half of them were replaced by women. Kind of interesting side effect. Oh, okay, all right. Um, so as many of you may be aware, or not, um, the use of the Me Too slogan was actually first used a decade before Alyssa Milano um, by Tarana Burke, and there she is, an African-American social activist who coined the phrase in connection with her efforts to provide empathy and support for young women and girls of color who had survived sexual violence. This term, Me Too, was used to kind of create solidarity. Uh, I think she used the expression unity by volume. Um, as survivors sort of told their stories to one another. Um, now, today, I think that the Me Too movement has kind of morphed from these restorative origins. You know, this is a sort of restorative justice mission for Tarana Burke. From these restorative um, origins to a movement that also seeks accountability, firing, <laughs> Um, and social justice. Uh, Me Too allegations and narratives often carry detailed accounts against specific individuals, you know, not just to provide the solidarity bonds. And I thought it was interesting. When we hear now that someone has a Me Too problem, it means um, that they maybe are in danger of being accused of harassment or uh, sexual misconduct. So despite this emphasis on accountability, I think, in the current Me Too movement, um, criminal prosecutions stemming from Me Too violations to date has, have actually been quite rare. Um, Harvey Weinstein faces criminal charges, but so far the biggest impact of the Me Too movement has been felt uh, outside the criminal law, with those accused of transgressions penalized civilly or privately by loss of positions or prestige. So I'm a teacher of, as was mentioned, employment discrimination law and tort law. And to me, this development has been fascinating because the civil side often takes a back seat to the criminal law in the public discourse about sexual abuse. The focus is, is, is that a crime? Or, uh, so this has kind of moved the discourse over to the civil and privatized side. So, um, so just a little bit about the Me Too narratives. So they really cover a wide range of behavior from conduct that's, that is cr clearly criminal, like Harvey Weinstein, to sexual harassment that may amount to a violation of civil rights law or tort. Uh, for example, the allegations against Judge Kaczynski, who was on the Ninth Circuit, one prominent allegation was that he 
asked his female clerks to come into his office and then he'd have pornography on his screen and he'd say, well, what do you make of this? And so this was something that I think you'd be hard pressed to see uh, a criminal law violation. Now, so I began to think about this and I at least I think that a significant feature um, of the Me Too movement is its broad conception of sexual violation. You know, it, it, from these narratives, you get kind of a, this picture of what amounts to sexual violation. And it reaches beyond conventional legal definitions of rape, sexual abuse, or even sexual harassment. It can cover conduct such as that committed by Aziz Azari, a comic and great um, uh, originator of the TV show um, and other uh, uh, kind of new types of uh, critiques on race and gender. Uh, and so uh, he, the uh, Me Too narrative that uh, I won't say Aziz Azari was never terminated, but he had to sort of take a break from his, uh, his uh, profession, uh, came from a, a woman named Grace, who was a 22-year-old um, who said that Aziz Azari uh, pressured her to have sex with him on a date. So the date kind of started in the West Village in New York, and here she is 22, Aziz Azari, um, is cool and, and a celebrity. You know, they have dinner. She's taking a picture of what they're eating. She's tweeting it out there. Um, and then they go back to his apartment and she says that he aggressively kissed her. He put her fingers down her throat. Um, he came on very strong. And she was saying things like, chill. Uh, why don't we relax for a second? And then at one point she said, you know, I don't want to feel forced. But as the evening wore on, he kind of persisted. And it never ended up with, um, there was oral sex. You can characterize, if you ever read the account, whether it was forced or not. Uh, but there was no um, allegation of rape. And the evening kind of ended. And after she wrote this account and she sent him an email saying, you know, I'm really upset with you, what you did to me. This was her sense of a sexual violation. And I was telling um, Jules earlier that I taught a uh, seminar on women and the law and we talked about the Aziz Azari case. And it, it was so compelling to students that I now think the whole semester was really Aziz Azari because it really kind of hit them where they were. And so I think as I thought about this case, um, that um, the, broad, the broader Me Too um, conception of sexual violation often incorporates a notion of affirmative consent. And we've seen this before, particularly with the campus rape crisis. Sometimes colloquially, this is known as only yes means yes. It goes beyond no means no um, and requires a knowing voluntary or and mutual decision to engage in sexual activity. And affirmative consent is also understandable by what it isn't. And it's not enough uh, consent uh, is, is different, does not equal silence, lack of resistance, passivity, or ambiguous actions. So to me, the debate that swirled around Anzari's actions with Grace demonstrated to me that Me Too was not just about enforcing established law, although it is that, but ch about changing norms and stimulating changes in the law. Um, so as students and lawyers, many of us want to know, will Me Too evolve from a cultural movement into a legal movement? 
uh, will Me Too be able to somehow embed itself in the law and close the chasms between the chasm between what feminists think constitutes equal treatment and what really tends to happen to women in everyday life. For example, in the workplace, will we go from a reality, and I think this is a reality for many in the workplace, where harassment and abuse is kind of an open secret and wrongful behavior is often normalized. Will we go from that to a norm where victims kind of regularly speak out rather than keeping it a secret and those with positions suffer, those with uh, status suffer consequences? Now, uh, many feminists, here's my feminist legal theory, are wary of law and skeptical that legal change has the capacity to transform social practices and norms. So I thought I would interject just a little theory into our discussion. And to do that, I'm going to introduce you to two theories of social change, and I'm giving you the nutshell version from Professor, one from Professor Viva Siegel, and she's a historian from Yale Law School, and then the prominent Catherine McKinnon, who's known around the world as a prominent voice on gender violence in the US and around the globe. So Siegel's theory is sort of like it resembles the French proverb, plus ça change, please excuse my French, <laughs> plus c'est la même chose, the more things change, the more they stay the same. Um, now in her theory of social change, Siegel explains the phenomenon of what she calls preservation through transformation. And kind of when you think about that, it seems contradictory. We think that the two terms actually you know, don't go together. But the way she explains the phenomenon is that it's a process through which the basic hierarchy may remain intact even though legal rules and legal rhetoric surrounding it undergo substantial change. And here is, I think, the most interesting aspect of her theory. In fact, you can preserve the basic hierarchy precisely because you've updated the rules and the rhetoric. Otherwise, um, it would upset the sensibilities of the time. So you kind of update it, make it more palatable, keep it the same. Or basically the same. And in the law, Siegel explains how a regime of inequality can soften. Oh, we used to say husbands had a right to beat their wives, the doctrine of chastisement. And then we said, well, they don't have that right, but you can't invade the privacy of the home. Then, okay, we're getting rid of privacy, but the Violence Against Women Act is unconstitutional because the federal government couldn't address domestic violence consistent with the Constitution. So this sort of, it softens, it emits more exceptions, provides a bit more protection, but the basic power structure remains the same. So what does Catherine McKinnon say? So first of all, I would start off, I think McKinnon would be um, the first person to say, by the way, I know about preservation through uh, transformation and the difficulties of affecting social change through law. But um, in her latest book, she says she believes that at times real or meaningful change is sometimes possible. Uh, for her, the trick is identifying which interventions at which moments can make an appreciable difference. So her book, Butterfly Politics, evokes chaos theory the idea of you know, the wings of a butterfly cascading can affect a uh, big transformation, such that unstable social systems, such as the system of sexual inequality, can sometimes be destabilized, even if they norm normally tend to return to their starting point when faced with a legal challenge. She maintains that the right small human intervention and an unstable political system can sooner or later have large reverberations. So everybody's saying, how do you get that one small? 
Uh, so I thought it was interesting for McKinnon. She's a political scientist and a lawyer. She has a view that the law can sometimes be a promising site for the butterfly effect. Um, despite the conventional view of the law as precedent bound and impervious to radical change, I mean, uh, but she, she maintains kind of in a nice contradictory way that the rule of precedent can itself be destabilizing when and if a single breakthrough iterated, you know, that one case iterated through many variations variations opens up a complex flood in a distinctive direction even as the precedential systems of law resist an initial breakthrough for which there is no precedent. So this all sounds kind of mysterious uh, but she also theorizes that the impetus for change for getting that initial breakthrough case if I want to say case or uh, often comes from social mobilization and feminist lawyering and activism, not internally from logic and precedent. So um, as I begin to discuss with you some of the um, aftershocks of the Me Too movement in the legal realm, kind of ask yourself, are we seeing preservation through transformation? Or is this the butterfly effect or both? Um, so I'm going to focus on, whoops, three areas. I'm going to talk a little about legal doctrine and sexual harassment cases. I'm going to talk about law student activism with respect to mandatory arbitration agreements. And then I'm going to talk about a phenomenon of investigations of sexual harassment conducted by large law firms. And I asked the students in Jules's class, I said, you can kind of imagine yourself in these situations as a lawyer, maybe having a sexual harassment case, or maybe you're going to engage in social justice in a more social mobilization or community organizing way, um, or you may be at a big law firm and saying, oh, I didn't think Me Too would be here, but here it is. So um, let's start with sexual harassment. So of course, it seemed obvious to me that if the Me Too movement was going to affect any area of the law, it should affect Title VII that prohibits sex discrimination and sexual harassment in the workplace. Uh, in fact, I would say that with the knowledge and um, consciousness raising that the Me Too movement has brought. It's kind of exposed Title VII. I hate to say it, I just finished that long doctrinal book as a kind of abysmal failure. <laughs> uh, one of Jules' students said, no law is good unless you enforce it, and, and of course. But the combination of lack of enforcement and restrictive legal interpretations has made it exceedingly difficult for victims to prevail even in clear-cut cases of harassment. There's some kind of legal obstacle put in their way. So even if we could agree we're not in Aziz Azari land, you know, even if we could agree that this is a clear-cut case of harassment, often victims don't prevail. It's very hard. And so a chorus of feminist legal scholars, and I just thought I'd put two people up that they're in the chorus, They've written a great book called Unequal, have expressed disappointment and frustration about the course of Title VII law and even before the recent Trump appointments. So um, for me, one burning question is whether Me Too will change courts and juries' conception of how a reasonable employee should act and respond to harassment and bias. All of you know that this construct of the reasonable person pervades every area, I, can, I think I can say that, of the law, you know, tort law, we start with the reasonable person. And it's the same in Title VII. So the, the reasonable person, the construct of the reasonable employee, comes up 
in at least three cases, uh, three instances. Uh, first of all, in order to have an action, actionable claim, you have to prove that uh, defendant's conduct resulted in a hostile work environment. How do you determine whether you have a hostile work environment, this kind of severe or pervasive harassment that constitutes a hostile work environment? Well, you ask whether a reasonable person in plaintiff's position would regard the harassment as severe or pervasive. Or employers are often given a defense to hostile work environment cases if the employee unreasonably failed to report the harassment. So there's the reasonable employee coming in again. Um, and in retaliation cases, and this is a big staple of Title VII law, the reasonable employee comes up again. This time, did plaintiff have a reasonable good faith belief that the conduct she complained about was unlawful? Now, courts embrace what they call objective reasonableness, the concept of objective reasonableness. And I have to say, I, I do think that what the courts have created is divorced from many uh, female employees' experiences and often requires women to act in unrealistic and sometimes even foolhardy ways. Um, this often means that employers win on summary judgment, never get to the jury. Um, for example, many courts expect plaintiffs to report every instance of harassment or risk failure of losing their lawsuit if they don't report soon enough. Yet the Me Too uh, movement in studies long before demonstrate that the vast majority of victims, 75 um, percent, face retaliation, um, uh, do not, excuse me, do not file formal complaints with their employer because they fear retaliation or loss of reputation. And this is for good reason because employees who do complain often who speak out often have faced some kind of retaliation. An EEOC report says 75% of employees who complain do face retaliation. And I tell you, just ask Debbie Brake, because she is the um, foremost authority on retaliation in the country. And it has a lot to do with this, um, and she looks exactly like I, you know, Debbie didn't like that picture, but I do. And okay, all right. So, um, so will Me Too remake the reasonable employee? Um, so, in this bleak winter, I've glimpsed a few little green shoots. And one green shoot comes from the Third Circuit. Hey. Um, in what could be an important sexual harassment case called Minarski versus Susquehanna County, it actually contains references to the Me Too movement and indicates that Me Too movement can shift a court's view of reasonableness. So the question in Minarski, it was kind of an ordinary sexual harassment case. Even ordinary ones are pretty bad, in my view. But a woman, Sherry Minoski, was a secretary in the Bureau of Veterans Affairs and a victim of sexual harassment by her supervisor, Thomas Yudalski. Um, and uh, she lost her claim initially because she failed to report the harassment to her employer. Like so many targets of the Me Too movement, uh, her supervisor, Yudlowski, was a serious, uh, serial harasser. He was known for repeating, repeatedly kissing and hugging female employees against their will, including Minarski. He also sent her sexually explicit emails and called her at home on her days off to ask her personal questions. That really got me. I thought, you know, work harassment was one thing, but when they're calling you at home. Um, and although he was actually reprimanded for his conduct with other women. She didn't complain. Um, it didn't seem to make any difference. He was still bold enough to keep on doing it. Um, and the harassment of Minarski went on for four years until the employer finally fired him after another supervisor 
overheard a conversation detail, detailing what had happened to Minarski. So I think this was a classic uh, example of, in a way, his, he's not a prominent guy like Weinstein, but it was kind of an open secret in that workplace. Why didn't she complain? It's kind of, why didn't she leave him? Why didn't she complain? She said, I had a young daughter who was ill and I couldn't afford to jeopardize my job. And she feared retaliation because she said, whenever she kind of stu stood up for herself, sort of pushed back against anything that he did, he got really nasty um, whenever she asserted herself. So the trial court granted summary judgment for the employer. They said as, um, it, that her failure to report for this long was unreasonable as a matter of law. Uh, and by the way, the lower court's ruling was entirely predictable. Many other employees have lost the right to go to a jury for failing to report for much shorter periods than four years. Um, but the Third Circuit reversed, ruling that the case should have gone to a jury to decide whether the plaintiff's failure to complain was unreasonable under the circumstances. In an important footnote, by the way, I tell my students, always read the footnotes carefully, not because I'm a stickler, I'm not a stickler, but because often that's where you get, first of all, you get the text, you know, what did they really say? And then you often get sort of what the court's thinking, sort of the, the entre nous kind of thing. So anyways, this is what they said, and I just have a little bit up here. The court said, this appeal comes to us in the midst of national news regarding a veritable firestorm of allegations of rampant sexual misconduct that have been closeted for years, not reported by victims. It has come to light years later that people in positions of power and celebrity have exploited their authority to make unwanted sexual advances. In many instances, the harasser wielded control over the harassed individual's employment or work environment. In nearly all of these instances, the Victims asserted a plausible fear of serious adverse consequences had they spoken up at the time that the conduct occurred. While the policy underlying Title VII places the onus on the harassed employer, employee to report the harasser and would falter for not calling out this conduct so as to prevent it, a jury could conclude that the employee's non-reporting was understandable, perhaps even reasonable. And I thought, they finally read David Brick. Um, and uh, that is, there may be a certain fallacy, says the court, that underlies the notion that reporting sexual misconduct will end it. Victims don't always view it that way. And as soon as I saw that, victims don't always view it that way, I thought, this is significant because it embraces a kind of victim perspective. Um, so, Minarski is just one case, and it may not seem particularly momentous at all, given that the court just uttered a simple truth about a report, employees' reluctance to report. We had 75%, 75% up there. Um, however, the attitude in this footnote um, behind does, if it carried over to other cases, it could produce a ripple effect because uttering the simple truth from the plaintiff's perspective about the pervasiveness and seriousness of workplace harassment in employees' precarious position in deciding how to respond to it could have a profound effect on the outcome of um, scores of cases. Okay, but, you know, I don't want to get you too excited. Think about even if Me Too somehow were to change the court's stance about workplace harassment, that would not be enough to transform the workplace for the simple reason that a large percentage, perhaps most, harassed employees are actually barred from bringing their cases to court. Um, this shocking fact stems from the proliferation of mandatory arbitration agreements. And I just have a law review article 
in which are contained all the facts I'm going to tell you. Gene Sterlite, you know, hot off the presses. Now, um, and these arbitration agreements, as you well know, require employees to take their cases to private arbitration rather than to courts, rather than to courts. Now, cases are decided by arbitrators, not judges, in an informal setting, not bound by the rules of evidence or rules governing discovery. Although arbitrators are supposed to and often do act as neutral third parties, they don't have to be lawyers or possess any legal training. And I think most importantly, because employers are repeat players in the private arbitral process, which is funded by the par parties, they have a built-in advantage over employees who are likely to be in arbitration only once. So it's not surprising that the empirical work cited in this article the studies indicate that plaintiffs win less often and win less money when disputing claims in arbitration. And also, for all intents and purposes, the arbitration decision is final. It can't be reversed by a court, even when the arbitrator gets the facts wrong or makes a serious error of law. Importantly, arbitration hearings are also closed to the public and the confidentiality of the process makes it difficult to study and critique. A lot of the studies that she uh, see, it take a long time for scholars to figure out what's going on in the, the world of arbitration. So many, many mandatory arbitration clauses that are now sort of routine also contain non-disclosure agreements. We've seen this in the age of Trump that require the parties to keep all aspects of the arbitration process confidential. The secrecy surrounding the arbitration process lessens the vi visibility of sexual harassment claims and stifles the cascade effect that Sunstein talked about. Um, I, I think it's important, at least, this is a, a strong statement, but I don't think these mandatory arbitration agreements are agreements at all. They're often contained in the fine print of the employment applications or employee handbooks. And prospective employees have no option to refuse to agree if they want the job for most employees. I think mandatory arbitration is a modern day Lochner regime where the employer has all the bargaining power. Um, so knowing a good thing when they see it, employers have gotten on the arbitration train. A recent study found that over 50% of non-unionized private sector U.S. workforce is covered by mandatory arbitration agreements and that per percentage has steadily increased. And I'll tell you, when I teach employment discrimination, you learn all this doctrine and the last chapter we do on mandatory arbitration, it's kind of like the old, you know, never mind. <laughs> right. So the federal courts have been of little help in this area even between, before the Trump Supreme Court appointments, the, uh, the Supreme Court was a fan of arbit mandatory arbitration. They've rejected numerous legal challenges to the practice. The court has repeatedly interpreted the Federal, federal Arbitration Act as trumping federal anti-discrimination laws and even preempting state laws. So for the most part, this means to defeat arbitrary, uh, uh, mandatory arbitration, either Congress might act, don't hold your breath, or private companies must be pressured to renounce mandatory arbitration and allow their employees to sue in court. So this is where student activism comes in. And like the larger Me Too movement, it started with a tweet. In March of 2018, a lecturer at the Harvard Law School tweeted out select provisions of a leaked copy of an arbitra mandatory arbitration agreement from Munger, Tolls, and Olson, a large West Coast firm um, that required associates, including summer associates, to sign. Once it just sort of hit the tweetosphere, um, this was such a negative response that a day after the tweet was announced on Twitter, um, Munger Toll said, oh, we're no longer requiring it. And a couple of other big law, for law, uh, law, law firms, Skadden and Oreck, followed suit. Well, the Harvard Women's Association soon thereafter said, well, launch, launched a project aimed at ending um, harassment and discrimination in clerkships and eliminating what they called coercive contracts. 
specifically mandatory arbitration clauses and non-disclosure agreements. The group, smarties, they targeted Kirkland Ellis. Why? Because uh, Kirkland Ellis is now the firm with the highest revenue of any law firm in the country. And they had a dump Kirkland hashtag. Uh, urging students to boycott the firm until it dropped its mandatory arbitration agreement. One week later, took a long time. One week later, Kirkland dropped its mandatory arbitration for associates and summer associates. The Harvard movement spread to other law schools with student organizations from nine other top law schools issuing a joint statement saying that they're not going to accept funds to support any law firm that has a mandatory arbitration agreement or refuses to disclose whether they have such an agreement. Woo. The quick success of the student activism indicates that students have power and that some organizations are afraid of reputational damage. Um, big law firms just don't want to be at a disadvantage when it comes to recruiting top talent, at least not now. Um, by the way, the women in the high tech industry have also had their activism have, uh, make a difference. Uh, we probably know about the walkout at Google. So far, Microsoft, Google, Uber, and Lyft, and Lyft don't have their mandatory arbitration agreements. So as important as this activism is, probably pressuring private firms to um, drop mandatory arbitration has its limits. It's not surprising that this activity comes from privileged women you know, the law firm professionals, the women in high tech. And that leaves out the vast number of lower wage employees who face harassment from in their blue collar and pink collar jobs. Also, to compound the issue, sometimes the law firms will say, okay, you don't have to arbitrate sexual harassment claims, saying nothing about race, disability, national origin, and they don't have any sense of the intersectional <laughs> nature of discrimination. But I was really impressed by the Harvard women's activism because they not only pushed to get rid of the mandatory arbitration for them, the new associates, but for all uh, non-lawyer staff positions and for all discrimination claims. Okay, very quickly now, that sounds good. You say, all right, good. You got a little action in the courts. You got activism. But, you know, if we really dig, even if the courts were more receptive, you weren't barred from bringing the claim to court, um, that might still just scratch the surface because most victims are not in a good position to file a lawsuit. And their potential recovery is often not substantial enough to encourage lawyers to take their cases, even on a contingency fee, which are used in employment discrimination cases. It's long been recognized that prevention, rather than co compensation after the fact, should be the principal objective behind anti-discrimination law. Indeed, you all know about it, oops, that um, you know, in the past 25 years, a whole industry has grown up of HR offices, EEO offices, grievance procedures, diversity training, all designed at preventing harassment and discrimination in the workplace. Um, unfortunately, uh, I don't think the record is very good in terms of we wouldn't have needed Me Too if all this worked so well. Um, and there's a problem with the fact that the HR offices are really, they may not have much power, and it's kind of inherently conflicted, isn't it? Because they're there, they're employed by the entity charged with discrimination and harassment. So um, what's happening in the wake of Me Too? Well, in the wake of Me Too, it happened before, but it's, it's intensifying now. When a company seems like it has multiple claims of harassment, or there's a claim against one of the big executives. They tend now to hire outside counsel. 
for example, one person who has done a boatload of these independent, big law independent investigations is Mary Jo White at Dever Boys in Plimps, uh, Plimpton, who was a US attorney and former chair of the SEC. The thought is that you know, now they're really going to get to the bottom of it. They're paying uh, on the average of $475 uh, an hour for this. Firms are shelling out a lot of money. Um, and I think, it's hard to tell, but I think maybe these reports are more extensive than you'd get from an internal HR office. Um, but before we get too excited, you know, there's still the kind of inherent conflict because these firms are hired, now I know they're hired by the board, not often by the company and not by the offending employee, but there's still this kind of repeat player problem because if the firm comes out and says, boy, you should have fired this guy 10 years ago, then will the next company hire this firm to do an independent investigation? Um, We'll see, I, you have to see the irony here. I did when I was piecing this talk together, that we've just like, um, the big law firms were targeted by law students. Those are now the very same firms that are the gold standard in doing the investigations. Lawyers win no matter what, and big law wins no matter what. Okay, so um, I think most importantly, most of the time, these uh, investigations are not made public. You know, you just prepare a report, send, this is sort of corporate law now, and send it to the uh, client. And, uh, but sometimes the reports are public. And there he is. You know, you got to come from the great state of Ohio, Urban Meyer, the legendary football coach. And this was an interesting Me Too aftershock. He was charged with covering up the domestic violence by um, a, an assistant coach who had come with him from Florida. They were very tight. And um, they brought in Mary Jo Small at Ebervoy's to do the independent investigation and do a tooth sweep. I said, oh, good, they're bringing in you know, outside counsel. They were supposed to be done in three weeks because guess what? Football season is starting. And so they did a report, and boy, reading the report, uh, it was interesting. I thought the facts were really well laid out, but the conclusions that the independent investigator, uh, the conclusions of the independent report, to me, were very charitable to Meyer. And I just felt like the report was using an implicit criminal law standard, almost like a beyond the reasonable doubt. Well, we didn't, you know, he, it's not clear that he really knew he was violating his contract when he didn't report the harassment. And he made these conflicting statements afterwards that, that were untrue, but he might have had a reason for thinking they could be reconciled. So um, he got a three-game suspension. Oh, you, th you think well, that was a big deal. Three games, it seemed like a slap on the wrist. My colleague calculated that not paying him for those three games was probably enough to pay Deba Voice to do the independent uh, investigation. Um, but he did resign after the season. And I thought to myself, it was unusual that Me Too has gone beyond sexual harassment in the workplace. The victim here was the wife of the assistant coach. And generally, you don't see universities getting upset because somebody's wife has been abused. So this to me was, OK, I'm taking a while to process this. Uh, one other. Les Moonves, CEO, CBS, um, big in independent report. It wasn't, they had probably, they had already fired him by the time Mary Jo White came in in Covington and Berlin. Uh, but Les Moonves had a $120 million severance 
payout. And CBS didn't want to pay. So the lawyers did a very extensive report. We would have never seen it, but it was leaked to the New York Times, including the text messages that have been provided confidentially to the lawyers. OK? One of them said <laughs> that later, you know, at some point, MoveEdge tried to cover up his uh, actions with respect to an actress, uh, Bobby Phillips. And he says, if Bobby talks, I'm finished. No, it wasn't. Yeah, I guess he was right. Um, but they withheld the $120 million severance. So big bucks, all right? So as you think about this, as I've thought about it, preservation through transformation? Are these independent investigations just like you know, 2.0? from the HR office? What about the students' activism, butterfly effect? Um, so the only thing I'd like to stop with, end with, is to say, as I look at this, and maybe it's fitting that it started with a tweet, I think that Me Too thrives in the sunlight. You know, to get change, you need to kind of see it. You have to see the narrative. You have to see what Moombez did to the various employees. Um, and I think that with, when activism, students, employees, and others uh, choose viable and achievable targets, boy, were they smart to go after mandatory arbitration. Because you could see it right there in the contract, and then they could immediately, and then they could get, get rid of it. And, you know, it was just a kind of brilliant strategy. Um, then uh, maybe we're in for something different than, you know, I've been waiting for that, <laughs> something different for a very long time. Thank you so much. You have to wait six seconds, the educational, sp and that's a long time. You know, have you ever waited six seconds in a class? <laughs> yeah. You needed big names for it. Mm -hmm. The question comes out of my fear that to some extent we go too far too fast. It doesn't happen well under the law. Do you have a concern about the due process issues that come out of the I do, particularly when the target of the harassment says, I didn't do it. Now, usually, as you well know, in these Me Too settings, one shoe drops, and you can, it's deafening because the other shoes are dropping so fast. I remember with Al Franken, I said, please, please, isolated and never happened. Bam, bam, and bam. So in terms of verification, sometimes the verification comes with the multiple stories, as I don't have to tell you. By the way, Catherine McKinnon says it takes three to five <laughs> women to make anybody believe. All right, so assuming we're confident that something like this happened, and that's critical to due process. Now, what about the measured sanction, OK? This is why I like the fact, Jules asked me the same question, similar question, that this, we're not in the criminal realm. We're not 
I mean, Weinstein maybe, but we're not putting people in jail. We're just saying to a serial harasser, maybe you shouldn't be heading this organization anymore. It's serious, but I think it's somewhat measured. And the other thing I'm beginning to see, I don't, I'm still processing it, is like the Urban Meyer situation. And it happened with another uh, faculty member accused of sexual harassment. We're getting these kind of, well, you can't teach for a year. Or, OK, you can teach, but you can't teach a mandatory first year course where people can't choose to be in your class. You know, I thought, can they do that? And I, you, and I thought, you, you better answer the question yourself. You've been in law teaching 45 years. <laughs> of, but we never thought about it before. And this is sort of proportionate responses. So my answer to you is I'm concerned about due process, but I'm beginning to see the kind of verification of the, is it really true? And is the response proportionate? I'm not saying it always happens. I think a lot of people just assume, oh, some one person making an allegation, the guy's life's ruined. Well, not really, when you really look more closely. Uh, thank you. Mark, it's so great to have you here. Hi. Hi I know who you are. Lisa, it's so good for you to be here. Yeah. Your talk and the, uh, partly, uh, the parallel to Arab Spring. Wow. Which we might not want to yeah. buy as a bar. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the bar seems kind of low. Um, <laughs> Yeah. Me too. And Michael Jackson predates me too. And but R. Kelly uh, does in some ways, but apparently not in some other ways. So can you can you talk about that and about the dynamics of yes, there's a bunch of uh, rich white guys who are taking it in the Krispies for doing this. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. And the the very real fraught issues about how race is mobilized or immobilized in all of this. So, Lisa, so good to see you. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm just going to put Arab Spring really quickly. Like that was Sunstein. I kind of liked it because it had it was um, social media in part producing uprisings that people said, whoa, these underlying conditions have been here for so long, and yet it's just sparking off, and it was younger people. So I like that. Beyond that, I'm going to like leave that parallel <laughs> alone. It, yeah. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, I did it because it kind of gets the juices flowing. All right. OK. So. Um, the racial dimension. I think Me Too is sadly um, a great example of a kind of until the prominent white woman now speaks it, it doesn't catch on. So I, I, probably every talk about Me Too starts with the, you all know about it from Alisa Milano, but really there's this woman that you've never heard of. Okay.
Um, now, and what I think Tarana Burke brings to it is a kind of at least understanding about who are the victims out there. And her victims are women and girls of color, particularly African Americans. So I like the sort of retrieving of the history of just even the term Me Too, because already I think as we talk about Me Too, we're thinking that mainly the victims are white women, which we've always, you know, sexual harassment has always been coded white. You know, the victims have been coded white. Then we have all the complexities of it, because as you pointed out with just the uh, African American and other minorities are often targeted with complaints about harassment. And, you know, just like echoing the whole legacy of rape, you know, maybe the claim is more likely to believe, be believed if it's made against a man of color. It happens. And I think, um, so there's real reason to be concerned about, like, did it happen? And is it the kind of thing that we have selective enforcement, that all the white guys have done it, it's kind of not been a big deal, and then the minority man. So there's that kind of still disparity. I always step back and say, at least it's a civil realm, and we're not talking about mass incarceration and over-criminalization, you know, because I'm there about let's not be putting these folks in jail all the time or thinking that's what we should be doing. One other thing, because there's so much to answer in your question, is that um, I think it's real mixed up now, you know? It, it's a function of our more complicated, more multiracial society that we are beginning to see more victims who are women of color in our minds, you know? And we're also seeing now the white guys <laughs> uh, that rather than the Mike Tysons. So I think the Me Too movement is at least capable of showing the complexity of the racial dynamics. But if I were Reva Siegel, I would say the same old problems exist and that is, it's going to help privileged white women. It's going to uh, hurt disproportionately people of color. And women of color are going to be erased out of this whole narrative. Those are, you know, that's, that's kind of always happened. And maybe it's going to continue to happen. Yes. Well, yeah, and Bill Cosby, I mean, so um, what's interesting about the Me Too movement, if I had more knowledge and more time, predated it. And it's like, you know, Me Too didn't come out of nowhere in 2017. There was all those systemic cases against the Catholic Church, against the Boy Scouts, you know, this, we already knew if you only knew about systemic injuries. And uh, Me Too just introduced it to a new generation. OK, very important, because you know memory gets erased from generation to generation. Uh, but also, I think the texture of the Me Too narratives was a little bit more than what we were getting from, you know, here's another. Catholic priest or a Boy Scout leader who's been charged with sexual assault. So there's the short history of the Me Too movement, and then there's the long history that really needs to be told. As a sexual harassment practitioner, ah. I wanted to add a little bit more about how multifaceted this all really is. It's not yes. Yes. And an economic issue. I mean, it's happening on every level, but I think low wage workers, male or female, white or black, 
or anything else, um, I think are still uh, not, their harassment are being held, taken to task the way that privileged people are, regardless of their race or their gender. True words <laughs> were never spoken. And so when we were in Jules's class, people were saying, you know, this is all fine with the high profile man and the new associates and the big law firms, but what about, you know, people? So this is why if Me Too is going to have an effect, I think that's why I picked out the three aftershocks, as Jules said, if we could change the conception of the reasonable employee, that might have a real impact. Yeah, I think that's an argument that's game changer, for sure. Good, good. Um, and I also think the activism, like you gotta get rid of the, you have to at least have the threat of a lawsuit. You know, the arbitration just, and it cuts off the narrative. So even if you lose in court, at least you were up there saying, this is what happened. Somebody could say an outrage. And <laughs> if you never get to there. So, but boy, yeah, big deal. Yes. Yes, good point. Yeah. Yeah. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. Unless yeah. It's such a good comment. So on a number of levels, first of all, let's take the gains we have made in criminal law. So old enough to remember arguing against the corroboration requirement in, with respect to rape cases. Uh, that was one of the first feminist reforms of the anti-rape movement in the 1970s. But did it really take hold? Any prosecutors around here? Is there an implicit corroboration requirement even in the criminal law? So as we draw these contrasts, you know, the gains we made in criminal law, is this gonna undermine it? First thing you have to say to yourself, as you well know, ah, I wonder how, much, how many gains we've actually made. All right, second thing is that uh, it reminds me of students that started getting, you know, binging way, even now, way back when on CIS. <laughs> you know, and they say, now you won't believe somebody unless you have, you know, that kind of tangible evidence. And there's a little bit of that. I think <coughs> there's always a danger of backlash. In fact, before you, Susan Faludi's book, Backlash, that was written in the early 80s, she said, the first thing you need to know about backlash is that it occurs before you've made any gains. <laughs> you know, that's, uh, and, and think about it. So this is, so we're now we're really used to thinking what are gonna be the bad after effects and unintended consequences. You know, we have just so much scholarship on that. But it's, I, again, it's sort of a balancing because I think the good part of the Me Too is not the part about the accountability. It's the, I call it Burkean, Tirana, <laughs> you know, uh, uh, part, which says, oh, this is common. Oh, this is shared. 
the consciousness raising aspects of me too. Ah. to impose, uh, this is not in the, in the sexual harassment mm. area, but to impose um, a legal requirement on multinational corporations that, are, um, that were um, established in their country um, with respect to grave violations of human rights yes. elsewhere. Mm -hmm. And what is happening though, what is feared and what seems to be happening, these laws are so new it's hard to tell, mm. it doesn't seem good, is that with this duty of vigilance is leading companies to go to court to get an imprimatur that oh. what they are doing is sufficient, that they are complying with what they need to do and they are vigilant. And so then they can keep on doing whatever it is they want. The second thing that really interested me um, about what you were saying um, with the Me Too response to Alyssa Milano is, of course, oh, you have all of these women, um, untold numbers for the first time, feeling released to talk about the things that have happened to them. But what astonished me, that did not astonish me, what yeah. astonished me, or did sort of, but what mm. really astonished me were the accounts of, of what happened in situations like the Matt Lauer one, where women did complain, and they, they, were, they were absolutely nothing was mm. done to help them. So that means these would be women who wouldn't be barred because they complained, they complained promptly, and yeah. apparently in many situations, women complain to their employers, um, not just promptly, but frequently, and yet nothing was done. I don't know, but on the, so on the one hand, it seems to me there's some improvement in that women are complaining in at least mm. some circumstances. On the other hand, the is just appalling. Oh, so much in that statement, and also important. First part, uh, your comparative point, which was uh, you had to do it, because that's who you are. But so important, and uh, those sociologists and fellow travelers among you know that Lauren Edelman, who works in this area, she's a sociologist who studies organizational behavior, um, has consistently found that these compliance structures are the good housekeeping seal, okay, of approval, and has come down very hard on saying, better not to do it, maybe, it's called bulletproofing, as Debbie well knows, uh, maybe better not to do it because then they go to court and the court says, ah, oh, this is a good employer, summary judgment. Uh, so this, and, and now I'm glad we have a little bit of um, a language to describe it. You know, I went, some talk somewhere, and somebody, you know, the check the box attitude. And so that's why the activism is good. And you can never, because the activism is all, it's a, don't tell me about checking the boxes. We don't want a compliance review. We want change. We want it now. Like, and when those Harvard students and the others got it within a week, and a, I was like cheering, you know, they finally. So um, and, uh, the other point about the women who do speak up, yeah, who do speak up. Um, so, you know, maybe they can't go to court because of the mandatory arbitration agreement. More importantly, uh, people tend not to sue when they're still working. You know, the people who sue are the ones who have been fired or who quit. Uh, this has always been the case. And um, just complaining won't do it. You have to fear that if um, you know, this is the positive incentive. If we just have these grievance procedures and they complain, we'll nip it in the bud. You have to have the big litigation stick out there at some point so they know that they can't just absorb the loss. And one of the, the most, um, I, I just find it dispiriting things, is that there have been so many systemic suits brought against companies for, for sex discrimination. You know, this is in the 90s. And they would just settle the cases 
lay out 130 million, which people would say was a huge award, and nothing changed. They could just absorb it. And if you're a Walmart, it's not even a cost of doing business. It's, it, you know, some of the plaintiff's lawyers tried to cost it out, and they said it's not even like five seconds of their... <laughs> so <laughs> it's a big deal, <laughs> and that's a problem. We have a question, Rhonda, and then... Mm -hmm. wanted to know if you wanted to offer any thoughts on Brett Kavanaugh. Oh, yeah, I have a few. <laughs> so... I... It was just wrenching. And when I made that little slide, I said, I, of course, he got elevated. He didn't get terminated. So, you know, I haven't said anything about Brett Kavanaugh. And I feel like that the hearings, it was a horrible recapitulation of Anita Hill, Clarence Thomas. The one place you don't want to try your sexual harassment suit, particularly one that occurred years before, is in front of those senators. Because we, it was stacked from the beginning. And even though, I mean, I, I, my response, I'm sure, was like Benny's. After she, Blasey Ford testified, I thought, Oh, thank God, finally. And oh, everybody was saying, this is it. And then he came and he was just forcefully said no. Like Clarence Thomas said, high-tech lynching. And it's on to the Supreme Court. Now, um, so Me Too brought her before the Senate, but didn't protect her. Same thing, it, you know, in a way it was such a replay. There were other women, but they got, their stories were all invalidated. The slicing and the dicing is what, you know, the, like let's take that incident, slice it off, dice it off. And so we end up, it's all about, do you believe her? And then clearly, insofar as there was any kind of actual deliberation going on, and I, wonder if there was. Um, I think they used an implicit standard of proof that was like, are we, you know, do we believe, has she proven beyond a reasonable doubt? When, of course, we're putting the guy on the Supreme Court, it's not even like we're taking away a job. This is where we should say, you know, actually, let's go to the next person. So, yeah. Oh. Here, and I am new enough that I was not here during the Shamala scare. Oh. And now all of us who were not know at least we got a little taste of what we missed. Wow. What a terrific lecture. Please join me in thanking you. Thank you so much, Amy. Putting this together and organizing this great event. So please join me in thanking you.